Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, very welcome to this second panel of today. Um, in this second panel, well, the idea is to look uh, towards the future of the energy. You know, in the first session, we were uh, trying to figure out the main impacts of the war in Ukraine, in the energy markets, and so on. So in this one, I wanted to try to to look to the future and address uh, long-term implication from global geopolitics of um, energy sector, um, in which uh, you know, we have uh, three uh, spectacular uh, speakers with us, uh, fortunately, to answer some of the question on in, like, um, in how this crisis is different, in which part we think um, it affects not just the energy landscape from one year or two years, but in the long term, and how we can see the future in the, um, the energy future in the in the next uh, five, ten, or even uh, thirty years, no? With uh, the decarbonisation um, trends. Uh, in the last year, we have seen all these industrial policies that have come um, into put into, into place, no? Uh, Inflation reduction act in, in the U.S., uh, the repower in the European Union. So uh, I would like to have uh, some light on the impact of these policies in the energy transition and in the and uh, in the energy composition, no, in the in, in the mix we have in, in our um, economies. So for having this uh, the discussion. Uh, in the first place, we have uh, Manuel uh, Rivago, Rivas uh, Rivago, sorry, uh, that leads the market analysis team of the Chief Economist Unit at the um, uh, Energy in the European Commission. He has worked on energy in several posts in the European Commission since 2004. Uh, prior to joining uh, the European Commission, he also served as microanalyst in Repsol and he has uh, some other private um, uh, employment. So he's a, a reference in, uh, in the energy markets uh, in the European Union and the impact. So he will have um, some minutes to talk about the, the, the energy landscape in, the, in Europe. Uh, second is um, we have with us uh, Anna Mikulska, a fellow energy uh, research fellow in uh, energy studies at the Center for Energy Studies at Rice University. Um, uh, uh, Make an Institute for Public Policy, excuse me, where she colleagues the program on energy and geopolitics in, in Eurasia. She's, uh, her research focuses on markets and geopolitics on energy within the EU, former Soviet bloc, and, and Russia. Uh, he's a, spe a specialist in, the natural, in natural gas and they use natural gas as a geoeconomic tool. So he will give us some clues about the future of natural, natural gas and what we can expect in the, in the next year. And um, finally, uh, uh, Nicholas Crawford, uh, our last uh, expert, has uh, focused on geopolitical and economic analysis. Um, he works in the International Institute of Strategic Studies. His research focuses on, on issues related to energy, critical resources, strategic technologies, um, he has recently published about uh, hydrogen, about um, uh, critical role resources. So he will try to help us with a very long-term vision about what to expect in the energy landscape in the very long future. So um, I will, wouldn't like to take the, the word anymore. And uh, please, uh, Manuel, uh, the floor is yours. Good. Thank you very much. So I'm going to present a bit um, the vision of the European Commission of what has been the crisis, the magnitude of this crisis. Also, how we have evolved the market developments that have brought us to the current situation and the policies that were accompanying these market developments. And finally, because this is a panel of the future, but we need to know exactly where we are. <laughs> I'll try to explain to you what is our vision for the short-term future. And then I will outline some of uh, also our vision in the European Commission for the medium term, up to 2030, but very shortly. 
So first, the overview of the crisis, which has been, but in a quantitative sense, I will give you now this, this quantitative sense of, of, of what happened in the crisis. Uh, this, this is a graph that could look very complicated. We have a lot of energy commodities here, and, 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 and you see a lot of peaks. Uh, so yeah, the prices increased a lot. Everyone can understand that. But you should look at the left-hand side of the, of the graphs here. This were the normal prices over the last 20 years for many of these commodities. We have increases of 10 times for wholesale gas, electricity, arrived to 400 euros per megawatt hour, while the price on electricity in Europe has been between 40 and 60 on average over the last 15 years. And retail gas, the, the prices that consumers pay, that you pay, that the small enterprise pay or the households pay, they also increase. They are less volatile because the, the, the retail prices not only depend on the cost of energy, they depend also on the cost for the transmission of energy and the taxes. The taxes are very high in Europe. Therefore, this softens the volatility of the prices. Nevertheless, prices in gas were 50 for at the beginning of the crisis. They arrived to 175. Now they are 150. Three times the prices. Prices for retail electricity now arrived 350, now around 300. 50% increase. These increases are were unprecedented, unprecedented to the point that uh, Fatih Birol, the director of the International Energy Agency, last year at some moment, we were not very happy that he was <laughs> spreading this concern, but he, he said that this crisis was comparable to the oil crisis of the 70s. And he said that because while the crisis, the epicenter is gas, which is then translated into electricity, the other commodities didn't behave very well. We had Oil prices above 100, which is historically a very high price. It's not unprecedented, but it's very high. The oil products, of course, follow that. And then we have coal with unprecedented levels. And even the cost of CO2 emissions doubled during the last uh, year. So, in unprecedented increase of prices that we already know from the other panelists. There are many reasons for this increase in prices. I have to say that for energy, it happened uh, as for the other commodities after the pandemic, growth pick up, the supply was relatively irresponsive, and the logistics chains were disorganized, and this increase in capacity of expenditure, people have been saving a lot <laughs> during the pandemic, resulted in a very in increased demand and in, in, in supply that was not able to, to meet that demand, and the prices increased. They increased for gas, they increased for other commodities, but they increased also for raw materials or for other manufactured goods. But there's a distinctive feature in the crisis, in the crisis for energy, and it, it, and it is Russia. It was the main supplier for Europe. More than 40% of the consumption two years ago, 45% of our imports. The prices have been increasing since 2021, and when we came to 2022, we had the war. And what happens when they have the war? We see continuous, I mean, very clear decrease in the pipeline flows from Russia. And this decrease was a weaponization of energy. First, the imposition to the member states to pay in rubles. This is taken as an excuse, and some member states are cut the supply. Then problems in Nord Stream, first maintenance, then maintenance related with the sanctions, which end in zero flows from Nord Stream. Nord Stream is, was the main pipeline for supply in Europe, 50 BCMs. More or less, we have a consumption of 350 to 380. So a very important part of our consumption. Of course, this happens at the same time that prices increase. Russia knew what, what they were doing. They were, every time that the prices, you can look at that, the prices, every time that the prices were relaxing, something was happening, an announcement of a cut to a member state or the maintenance problem. Russia was trying to get more revenues 
and at the same time put pressure by reducing the supply to Europe. And this, in the end, brought us to this peak, which is completely unprecedented for the prices of gas in the middle of the summer, because the reduction in the flows from Russia concurred with the need to increase the stocks to be well prepared for the winter, and brought us to levels which have never been seen in Euro, 350 euros a megawatt hour for wholesale, while in the pandemic the wholesale prices were three euros. Well, this is an exaggeration, but in historical terms, we are talking about 20 to 350. You, you, you made the numbers. Implementation of the legislative initiatives. Of course, um, this I think has been already explained by my colleague of the commission. There has been a plethora of initiatives and regulations, emergency regulations that had to be approved in order to address the crisis, to address the impact of the crisis on the consumers and the households, and to try to improve the, the situation that we were facing. I will not be detailed here because I think it was covered. I will just talk about, I think, what are the three fundamental issues that help us to weather the storm that we saw during the summer. And, and the policies that helped that these fundamentals behaved in the right way. First, we had to replace the Russian gas. We had lost a huge amount of Russian gas. We were importing by pipeline 340, we were getting 60. 80 BCMs, a lot. For, an for, for a market of energy, which where the prices are super inelastic, that means that they, they increase very quickly when there's not enough uh, supply, the risk of having very high prices was very high and it materialized with the explosion of prices during the summer. How do we address that? Address that by increasing, replacing, by increasing the supply, replacing this Russian gas. Of course, we couldn't cover everything, but through a lot of, I would say, policy, outreach, uh, missions from the member states, missions from the European Commission to several uh, suppliers other than Russia, we managed to increase a little bit the supply of pipeline from Norway, also from, uh, I think, uh, the UK, there was much more increase of supply, but definitely what it helped a lot was the increase of LNG, and LNG coming from the US, as Anna will explain later on in more detail. Uh, LNG represented 10%, 15% of our total supply in Europe now is 30%. And well, you look here at the uh, increase of the amount of LNG from the US. Uh, without that, we wouldn't have been able to, to, to go through the crisis without shortages. We didn't have shortages during the crisis. We managed to avoid the scarcity. Next slide. We have not only increased in Europe our supply, but we have also increased our capacity to import more. During the last year, we increased our regasification capacity by 20 BCM. It is a lot, but the most important thing is the signal that we give for the next years. In two, three years, we should have 50 BCM more of capacity for regasify LNG. So clearly, Europe is giving the signal, LNG, we are going to need it. We will need it for a long time we have the capacity to absorb it and inject it into our, into our system. So, main actions, first is replacing gas, increasing your supply, then we look at the demand side. What can we do in the demand side to compensate for this missing gas? First thing, gas storage. That's a, a successful story. Hmm? We promoted this regulation that sets obligatory targets for every member state for having high levels of storage and have 90% of their storage filled before the winter comes. And it was implemented beautifully by, by all the member states. And this has been key for this year and will be key for the, for the following years. I mean, the number, the, the storage are now we're 95% at the beginning of this heating season. Now they are 60. Well, these numbers are a bit outdated. 
But you can see it with this graph. The graph is very clear. This is the normal historical range of storages. This is where we are. Up. I mean, very high. Historically, super high. Then the other and very important piece of, I would say, legislation and also part of the efforts that help us to be able to avoid the storage, the, the shortages was the, con the containment and reduction of our demand. I can talk about the legislation of the, the regulation which was adopted by, 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 by the Council, which was encouraging the member states to reduce by 50% their demand for gas compared with, was, with what it was, the normal demand, which was uh, the, la the one of the last, the previous five years. That was the compromise. It's a voluntary compromise. The regulation has in, in built some mechanisms to make it obligatory if the situation worsens. But in principle, it is a voluntary regulation. And what happened, well, member states apply that, it's implemented. It's not only because the member states implement and promote policies for energy efficiency for reduced consumption. It, it is also because the prices were so high that there were a lot of economic incentives from people to consume less. And we overshoot the target. We reduce 20%, almost 20% so far, the data until January, of the consumption, reduction of consumption over the last months. In January, only 22%. Again, so you understand the numbers in BCMs. Hmm? We are missing 80 BCMs of Russian gas. This amount that we have saved is 40 BCMs until now. Half of the missing Russian gas. So it's just to exemplify the importance of the measure, as it always happens in Europe. Across member states, the thing is very different. The picture is very different. The Baltic states, very efficient in reducing their consumption. Some others, less efficient. I will not name any of them. Um, well, but these numbers, you don't get them without having France and Germany reducing more than 20% their, their consumption. And they did it, and it helped a lot. So this, this is just to explain you. That those were the main, I think, factors that, the, that explain that so far there were no shortages and explain the current situation now. Where do we are now with prices? We are prices which are historical level, historical, uh, historical at levels which are two, three times the historical levels. It's still very high, but it's much better than we have seen during 2022. So now, what we think could happen in the coming year or the coming years? We have a very good start now. This, this year we are going to end this winter with the stocks that will be more than 50, possibly close to 60. This is a lot. That means that to replenish your stocks in the injection season, the period in the spring and the summer, it will be quite easy to arrive to the maximum storage level in the coming six months. So that would put us again in a very good position, good start, well prepared for the next winter. Assuming that we keep the current normal market conditions, which are abnormal, <laughs> but assuming that we have these abnormal conditions stable, and that we don't increase our consumption too much, most likely we shouldn't have any problem at all this year regarding security of supply and shortages. There are risks in the market, everyone talks, a harsh winter, harsh winter can reduce 20 BCMs, your consumption, one year. The risk of the Asian demand that we have estimated that not much, 10 BCMs, even if all these things appear at the same time, we have a sort of black swan scenario now with, without keeping the Norwegian pipelines, please. This is the only thing we, can, <laughs> we need to keep because otherwise we, we have in an emergency we would be passing this year without shortages. This doesn't mean that this 
will not have consequence. It will have, but it will have for the next year, in which we will be starting the year with much more difficulties to replenish our storage, etc., etc. But we also have to think, what is the probability of having two black zones two years? I don't know. Well, as far as we can see, this year looks reasonably good. What the market thinks about that? The market thinks the same thing that we, we think. Good, this time we are aligned, not like in the summer. Uh, you see here the expectations. Oh, sorry. Market expectations, these dots are the bets in the market for what the prices will be. In December, these numbers were here, 130 to 150. Now they are 50 to 60. So the market bets, thinks that the prices will be much lower than they were. It's a drop in the levels, which is very important, because he thinks that we will be relatively well supplied, at least for this year. Other things have been helping, and in particular, the, the deployment of renewable energy. We are at high records levels now in Europe of the, depo of the deployment of, of, of of wind and solar, in particular no, solar. Solar is making requests. We are talking about 50 gigawatts, 22, 70 gigawatts estimated for next year. This is increasing at 16, 17% per, per year. This is potentially saving 10 BCMs, 13 BCMs each year. Of course, the, it's an economic case. We have produced and we have adopted the new regulation to accelerate investments, to have impact assessments which are easier, but the economic case is made by the price of gas and the market is reacting and uh, evolving at a very quick speed to uh, deploy renewables. And now just looking at the more the longer term, the, the here is more difficult. He, we can see the impact of the, of the world in our vision for the long term. Before the world, this is the 50 for 55 scenario. This is a scenario in which we have policies to be able in 2030 to reduce our greenhouse gases emissions by 55%. We were thinking that we would reduce our gas consumption by 20%. Now, with the current scenarios of Repower, which is our say master plan for replacing the gas, the, 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 the dependency of fossil fuels from Russia before 2027, this number could arrive to 66. But the reality probably will be in between. But is showing that Europe is going to reduce very quickly his consumption of natural gas. Well. The, I said it before, the economic case is made with these prices, the projections for wind and solar with have increased. You can see repower much higher than the 55. It's not only this wind and solar, and I, the, uh, Nick and Anna probably will speak about that. There is much more, not now, but Probably after 2025, the expectations that there will be significant amount of biomethane and at the end, uh, close to 2030, much more renewable hydrogen and hydrogen, which could serve to replace our demand for natural gas. And I will stop here because I said a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of graphs. Thank you very much. I'm not in the way of my own slides. I wait for the presentation to load. And thank you very much. It's a it's a good introduction, but also you will probably see quite a lot of this similar um, uh, similar uh, f uh, graphs. So I won't really speak to what the graph is. I will be speak about the situation that it presents or that situation that it could actually um, uh, spark going into the future. Thank you very much for being here and 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 um, kind of being interested in in what uh, what kind of you know what 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 is what's gonna happen as we go forward, not only what what we have done and is this this one? Oh, this one. Oh, this one. Yeah. Okay. So 
I'll try to kind of put some type of framework within which we could actually talk about geopolitics, not only kind of what would happen in the market, but also what the geopolitics actually involves here and what's changing the politics and what will be changing as we go forward. Entrance of the US into the market, as Ben actually has said, changed quite a lot in the market for both oil and gas, particularly so that it's actually not the US government that owns oil and gas, but US private companies. And that's a big difference. It's, it's a big difference because the national oil companies that, are run, in, that run in Russia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, or so on, they are actually dependent on state policies and not on markets. This is completely different within the US environment, where it's not the government that decides where oil and gas is going, it's the companies that decide that they sell, to where they contract it, and then the oil and gas goes to any place in the world that offers best price. And as we've seen in, for Europe, th this was Europe in terms of gas last year. <laughs> so the geopolitics, of course, has changed with the Russian invasion on Ukraine significantly. In the, specifically in the way that it brought energy security into the focus of states. And this has not been the case, particularly in Western Europe. In Central Eastern Europe, very different situation. Energy security has been there very strongly and ingrained because these countries have already had quite a lot of experience with what it means to be dependent on Russia, including for oil and gas. And they actually didn't want to be. In fact, Poland has already had, before the invasion, policy which would stop import of Russian gas end of 2022. Too. So when, the, when, when Russia actually uh, asked for ruble payments for gas, Poland said, well, it's fine, we're not going to get it. And that's, that's the difference. In the West, energy security was kind of not in the center of, center of the argument, or, or not, not on, in the center of attention. This has changed in a similar way as, it, uh, as, in, uh, as with oil in the 1970s. Um, now, countries start looking at, well, are we going to have secure access to energy? But what it means? So there are different types of um, definitions of energy, uh, energy security, but the one I really like is, is easy to remember because these are the four A's of energy security. Availability, affordability, accessibility, and acceptability. And last year, all of these failed for Europe. Every single one. That's why what, we have, what, what Europe has experienced was so radical, and that's why the policies that have been implemented have been relatively radical. So availability. We've seen the graphs already about uh, Russian gas coming to Europe. We, you can see the drop actually happening here very well. And actually, it already started in 2021, as, as um, Katya has mentioned. Uh, Russia has decreased. The, uh, the amount of gas that was coming to Europe. It actually still was providing all the contracted volumes, but there was another piece of information that was important. A lot of the contracted volumes weren't coming from Russia. They were coming from inside of Europe, from the storage that Russian company Gazprom owned. So, and that's why the storage actually, uh, and th that's where the storage loss in the EU come from. Because at some point, right when the storage should be at 90, 80%, the gas from storage was at 20. The Russian state was preparing to employ its energy weapon. It has done so as the shooting war began, and we've seen it in uh, several of the presentation, how it kind of uh, has decreased very, very significantly going forward. So availability, we have, of course, lost those, all these, uh, all these uh, volumes of gas from Russia, and something else had to come. Well, there was a strong call on Norway, of course, but also on LNG, because this is the volumes that are relatively flexible. So a lot of US LNG came to the European market. It's important, however, to, to understand there is, this, there is this only limited LNG volumes in the world. This cannot be, they cannot, it cannot be more produced at an instant. And this is because there is a, there is a need for a huge amount of infrastructure that takes time to build and that's very expensive. So 
that is only as much as LNG today and tomorrow, and we know exactly how much of new LNG is coming into the markets going forward. So we know about the availability. At the same time, and there was actually a question about the volumes uh, with, with, uh, that they are going to from, from Russia. At the same time, the volumes that Russia was sending to Europe cannot actually be distributed anywhere else. They are in Western Siberia, and Western Siberia is connected only to Europe, which means the global market cannot kind of put, uh, displace them as easily as it is with oil, or you know, easier than uh, at least. Then that means that LNG has to fit the, fit the bill. So US, was, US LNGs was quite successful, and in fact, the US LNG exporters have worked over time at peak capacity often. A lot of LNG entered the market and, and, um, and flown into the global market. Now, the other thing that's important to understand is that, oh, oh it's actually, that US LNG, how US LNG is sold. Because it's not as some imagine that there is this US LNG flowing to the market and US LNG exporters are coming here and cashing in. Actually, quite different. US LNG is sold as soon as it is, is injected into the LNG tanker. And it is sold at the price in the US. Let's see, do I have the price? The green line is the price of gas in the US. The red line is the price of gas in Europe. So somebody else must be making the money. Well, again, US LNG is sold on contracts, but these contracts, as Ben has actually mentioned, they are very flexible. So first of all, they, the ownership of LNG is, uh, ends, ends as soon as uh, LNG enters the market. Then the companies who buy that LNG for the Henry Hub American price can take it wherever they want. There is no destination clause. And then they take it based on, on price, right? And these are actually, these, are, these were not, there was no American company there. It was usually the, uh, the European majors, uh, Chinese companies, uh, the traders, all the middlemen that figured out that this is actually a great opportunity. And thankfully for Europe, because Europe needed it and could pay the price. Let me see, go back. So this is what's going to be happening in, in the US. And I want to talk about it because it's actually quite important with regard to, well, what will happen? Can we, can we, can we count on US LNG? Is there going to be more of it? Because at this moment, we already know what's going to come uh, as, we, as, as we go. Now, there is a lot of LNG approved already in the US, but not built. And here is actually the very important part that EU could, make, could do. Uh, because, and we talked about the fact that you, EU companies do not like to sign the longer contracts because um, they're not sure whether or not gas is going to be used in Europe for 20 years, 25 years, right? But without those contracts, US companies who have already projects permitted are not able to start them. They actually need to go to banks and ask for loans. And those loans are not going to be given to them unless they already have these anchor customers who say, well, yes, we will buy from you. So if there aren't enough of these customers, even some of the permitted projects might actually never come to pass. If that happens, well, that means that a lot of the LNG that's going to be in the market, uh, there might be still quite a lot because we will see you know, Qatari LNG, Russian LNG actually coming in but they will have a different structure. More of it will depend on policies of the state because they're either controlled by state or owned by state and not by the market as uh, the US, uh, as it is the case with the US companies. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. So accessibility. We know that there is only limited LNG available, but also accessibility was a problem. In, for, for Europe uh, last year. There just wasn't enough LNG import terminals in the places that actually needed that LNG because 
there was actually enough LNG capacity, in particularly in Spain. Spain has a lot of LNG capacity, but that LNG could never be transported further to you know, Germany and, and so on, because there is no pipeline connection. So the infrastructure, it wasn't only that the infrastructure on the export side is not right, uh, available right away, it also that the infrastructure in the import side is not available. We've heard that there's a lot being built now, right? So that's, that's, that's a good thing. There's interconnection being built in between. We've seen actually interconnection between the two LNG terminals in Central and Eastern Europe, Lithuania and Poland, finished. Crucial, Baltic states have never had a land connection with, in terms of gas before. Finland had never had a land connection from Europe with gas before. Extremely important, and that's, that's what's happening. So this is kind of, you know, uh, our, uh, this comes from one of my papers and we, we've shown what actually the pipeline from Spain could bring into the European market as additional supply of already existing uh, infrastructure, that can use already existing infrastructure. That's not happening for, for different, I think, geopolitical reasons, really, uh, and, and, and France really not willing to, to commit to a pipeline that would go through its territory. And if somebody's interested, I'm happy to answer the questions. So what's next? We talked about renewables, and we will talk about renewables, but for now, oftentimes it's coal. A lot of coal is being used in Europe now. In fact, Germany is building a new lignite mine, new. So if this is a short-term fix, well, how short is this short term going to be? Right? We've had this question, Jeff asked this question at the beginning, how short is this short term? And I don't think anybody really knows. A lot of it might depend on the technology development. Will technology develop enough to actually make the renewable energy less intermittent? Will batteries become better? For now, batteries can can kind of fit, what, four hours of the grid kind of uh, functioning can, can help with that. If that's the case, well, then a lot of the developing world will still be calling on coal in particular. And why? Because coal is distributed much more democratically around the world. It's in many more countries. And going back to energy and security, well, the most secure fuel in your country is the one that's in your country. Right? Because no, you won't, its availability is not dependent on, uh, on uh, somebody else or some other country. So that's, that's important and that's where, where a lot of that um, energy security actually conversation comes in, in terms of COP discussions and so on. Um, so I will stop at that. Appreciate it. So I guess from the fact that you're all still here that you must really love natural gas. So the bad news is I'm going to talk about clean energy instead. Um, we've heard a little bit about it already, uh, that the energy crisis, partly as a result of the war in Ukraine, has encouraged uh, Europe to invest and accelerate uh, the uh, transition towards renewables. Uh, we've seen a lot of effort to improve the permitting process for renewables to speed up uh, new projects, and that really needed to be done. You, for some offshore wind projects in Europe, it can take between 10 and 15 years from the signing of a lease to the wind farm actually becoming operational. So <laughs> you can see that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of improving that process. And despite that last slide about coal, I think given that renewed commitment to the energy transition in Europe, I do think the current energy crisis in the long run will probably be a net positive for Europe's energy transition. And we've, we've seen the, uh, the slide from Manuel as well about uh, renewables taking away 10 BCM of gas each year. And that, that's, that's great news. I think it's also worth highlighting the commitment in Europe to hydrogen. Uh, and Ben mentioned hydrogen earlier. You know, the, the industries 
that have been worst affected by the energy crisis are those really energy intensive ones. As Ben said, they're, they're steel, uh, glass, cement, and chemicals. And the solution for the energy transition for those industries is almost certainly going to be hydrogen. Probably not until the 2030s, uh, but it will either be hydrogen, probably green hydrogen, produced from renewables, uh, or it may be carbon capture and storage. So uh, Europe has uh, poured more money into hydrogen over the last year and set more ambitious targets. Uh, and as we've also heard already, the second big lesson besides transitioning faster. The second big lesson for Europe from the war in Ukraine has been to avoid relying on countries like Russia for critical resources. And so that's put Europe's dependence on China for clean energy technologies and for critical minerals on the radar as well. And so Europe is now completely aligned with the United States on that ambition to cut reliance on the United States. Uh, sorry, on, on China for those uh, critical minerals. So anyway, there was some good news. Good for energy transition in the long run. Uh, good for commitment to diversifying away from China. But it, it, it's not, sadly, all good news. Of course, in the short term, renewables still rely on things like steel. Uh, a wind turbine requires steel for the tower. Uh, solar panels require steel for the racking. And steel's become a lot more expensive uh, because of the cost of energy. And that has pushed up the cost of installing new renewables. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the major wind turbine producers, Siemens Gamesa, partly here in Spain, um, uh, Vestas from Denmark, General Electric, headquartered in the US, they're not making a profit currently. In fact, in many cases, they're making a loss because of high prices. And so there's a lot of work to be done around renegotiating some of the current contracts uh, to, to allow them to make, uh, make some profit. <coughs> and we've also touched briefly on the issue of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, but I think it's worth going into it in a little more detail. Now, uh, Inflation Reduction Act is a package of $369 billion estimated uh, of subsidies for clean energy industries. We don't actually know the amount uh, because these are just projections uh, from the uh, Congressional Budget Office. It could be much more. Uh, and as Ben mentioned, within the Inflation Reduction Act are a lot of subsidies that treat US goods preferentially. And so there are three main problems with it from a European perspective. Firstly, the fear that companies will prioritize investment in the United States, clean energy industries, over investing in European clean energy industries. And that comes at exactly the time, with this energy crisis, that Europe is trying to invest more, faster, in the energy transition. The second problem is that in a few years' time, the IRA may distort trade in clean energy, in green technology, and in critical minerals. But the third problem, perceived problem, with the IRA, again touched briefly on earlier, is that it adds to big worries in Europe, particularly in Germany, about deindustrialization. So linked to those energy in intensive industries uh, we've already mentioned, with European energy prices so high, there's a lot of worry about their viability in the longer term. Okay. Some of the industries have coped pretty well so far. They've managed to reduce their energy use, they've managed to increase their energy efficiency, uh, and, they've, and some of them have maintained their output. Others have coped less well, particularly chemicals. Uh, and you may have seen that BASF, the big German chemicals company, in fact, the biggest chemicals company in the world, has permanently scaled back its production in Germany. And it, and it made very pointed remarks about energy costs being lower in the United States. And so because the IRA subsidizes clean energy in the US, and because it subsidizes hydrogen particularly heavily, it's fueled this worry that Europe's current problems in intensive, energy intensive industries 
could be a much more permanent issue. Now, I don't think the Inflation Reduction Act is as big a deal for European industry as many people fear. And there are four main reasons for that. Firstly, in many of the goods that the Inflation Reduction Act subsidizes, you see local production for local markets. Look at electric vehicles. They will probably be produced in the United States for the North or within North America for the US market anyway. That's already for, for the big European car companies, whether it's Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes, their best selling models in the United States are already produced in North America. And that would continue to be the case with electric vehicles anyway. And you want your battery production close to your car production because it reduces supply chain risks. So it was very likely that once EVs were produced at scale, the battery production would have moved to the United States for the US market as well. Meanwhile, Europe will continue to produce electric vehicles and batteries for the European market. And the same goes for wind turbines. Wind turbines are already produced locally for local markets, particularly the blades and the nacelles, which is just huge and incredibly difficult to transport across the Atlantic. So, the, so already Siemens Gamesa and Vestas have production in the United States. The other big European producer, Nordex, produces uh, its uh, turbines in Mexico, uh, which is unfortunate because they won't benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act and they may have to move. Second reason why I don't think the Inflation Reduction Act is such a big deal. Europe actually plays a really small role in some of these industries and would continue to do so for the duration of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is through to the early 2030s. In critical minerals, Europe plays almost no part. It was never going to be an exporter to the US. In the solar industry, the only bit of that value chain that Europe plays a big part in is something called the uh, transformer that converts um, alternating current, uh, sorry, uh, direct current into alternating current so solar panels can feed into the grid. But it's only 6% of the value of a solar panel. And so it probably won't be affected by the Inflation Reduction Act. The third sector, uh, the third reason is actually given the targets for renewables rollout in the United States and in Europe, really big targets it looks like there'll be enough demand to go around. And investors can feel pretty confident still investing in Europe that there'll be en enough demand to make investments here viable. And the fourth reason I don't think we should be too concerned about the Inflation Reduction Act in Europe is, despite the subsidies, there are still some big constraints on US industry and how quickly it can scale up its renewables sectors. In terms of skilled labour shortages, uh, that, that's a big one, uh, which we face in Europe as well, but Europe is a bit more advanced with its programs to train workers. Uh, and the other thing is actually the cost of capital, the weighted average cost of capital in the United States is higher uh, because the uh, central bank rates, so federal reserve rates, are higher. Uh, there's a slightly higher premium in Europe, but it doesn't outweigh the fact that the cost of borrowing is bigger in, in the US. And that has a really big impact on the cost of a new factory, or a new wind farm, or a new solar farm. There is one sector where we should maybe be a little more concerned, and that's hydrogen. And as I've said, it's a big priority for Europe in those energy-intensive industries. Uh, it's, really, it's immature at this stage, and there are realistic concerns uh, that some of the investment in this immature hydrogen industry could prioritise the US instead. And that's because the scale of the subsidy in green hydrogen in the US is huge. It's $3 per kilogram of hydrogen. At the moment, in the best places in the US, places like uh, South California, you can produce hyd green hydrogen probably at around $4.5 per kilogram. So that means the cost is brought down to one and a half kilograms per, uh, 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 sorry, one and a half dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. And the cost is expected to come down over the next few years by 20 to 30. And so the cost of that subsidy, uh, subsidized green hydrogen may in fact be negative. 
So there's a big opportunity for hydrogen investors to make a profit in the US and less of an opportunity in Europe. That said, there is demand for hydrogen in Europe because we're trying to move away from this expensive gas and there's much less of a reason to move away from gas in the US. So demand is stronger in Europe, supply will be stronger in the US. And it'll be interesting to see how it works out, but I think for now, investment in both regions is a good bet. So I'll conclude with one point, returning to the deindustrialization of Europe issue. I think despite the limited impact of the IRA, deindustrialization is still a realistic concern. The war in Ukraine has brought it onto the agenda faster than might otherwise have been the case. But the reality is that in most of Europe, clean energy, and therefore also green hydrogen, will never be as cheap as it is in parts of the US or some other parts of the world. Spain is a bit of an exception, but it's true of most of the rest of Europe. And so I do think there are big questions about the future of some industries, especially the chemicals industry in Europe. And I do think that will be a real source of tension between, the Europe, between Europe and the United States in the years ahead. Thank you uh, very much, Nicholas and previous speakers. Um, I give you just a very uh, a small question for any of you, and I open the floor to, to questions from the audience. Um, I start uh, with Manuel. Uh, I have some questions. How, the, how do you see the main challenge in implementation of the Repower U and how we are doing this deployment? If you see some imbalances, for instance, in uh, how fast are we going um, in uh, um, increasing the capacity of renewables, but not so fast in the grids, for instance, electricity grids, or uh, the electrification in demand, because we will have this incentive to change from gas to electricity, given the composition in the, in the market. So this will be one of my questions for you. Um, for Anna, you made me very easy the question because you mentioned uh, the interconnection with France. So there are, there's your question. Why do you think France is not interested in having a gas pipeline with Spain? So it was very easy to make it for you. And for Nicolas, uh, my question goes um, related to the Global Gateway Initiative um, in, from Europe. Uh, how do you think this impacts the energy development in other countries? And uh, to what extent do you have uh, it to balance or not um, the Belt and Road Initiative from, from China? Very short question, if you might, uh, because I would, give, would like to give the floor to the audience. Okay. The question was implementation of free power. Hmm? Yes. Well, I'm very happy you didn't put me the question of France and Spain. Because <laughs> for the European Commission, it's always very delicate to, to talk about that. Repower, I think we have much more consensus that we have to reduce our dependency of the fo Russian fossil fuels. To do that, the plan of repower, is one part was diversifying, so getting some other sources of gas. And but it was not only, by the way, gas. It's also coal. It's also fossil fuels. Uh, other fossil fuels is, is crude oil and refined products. So in that part of diversification, I think we are advancing very quickly and we are doing a very good job, including for, for crude oil, refined products and, and coal, but this has been done through the sanction systems and the caps imposed by G7+, Plus, which make that right now we import no more coal from, from Russia, we import only 90% of the imports that we had on crude oil and seaborne. It's, it's very limited. Only Bulgaria is getting some crude oil uh, from Russia. And those who can still get this crude oil are landlocked states. They need time to find alternative solutions. And in gas, well, in gas, uh, the Russians did the job for us by cutting <laughs> the, the gas and then we, we found other sources. Of course, that was one part of the plan and the other part of the plan was we had to accelerate renewables, uh, the deployment. I think we, in, in, in the, 
renewables for electricity, we are advancing very, very quick, as I said before. On the replacement of gas by renewable gases, this will take more time and this is going to be more challenging. And this fits also with the whole challenge of, 20, of, of 2030 for Europe, in particular in electricity, because <coughs> in just now less than 10 years, we will have an electricity mix which is now more or less 60, it's already 60% eh? renewable based, will be more than 80 in few years. This, this is a huge challenge for investments because to manage a system which is based on variable energy is much more difficult and will require a lot of investments in the system in order to develop a storage, to develop also demand response that could compensate for the variability of this energy. There will be cost in the middle, this is for sure. When you have a transition from a system which was based on fossil fuels to a system that will be in renewable energy variable, there will be duplicity of investments, there will be cost. But at some point, this will work out and definitely the cost for electricity could be much lower. Particular with the reform of the market design that the Commission is preparing and will be debated for two years. In one of the objectives there, if that will be a discussion with the member states, is to manage or to get electricity prices which are closer to the production cost of renewables. For that, a lot of thinking, this will be presented in two weeks, but obvious solutions are facilitate or foster what we call the contracts of difference, which means that you get a fixed price, two, two sides. Huh? When the price is lower, you, you get extra money subsidy. When it is higher, the money goes for, for the state. And in that way, you de risk completely the investment and you know that you will be able to amortize the investment with a, a specific rate of return for some years. And other more market solution, long-term market solutions, which could be agreements, what we call the purchase power agreements, which are direct long-term agreements between uh, producers and consumers to receive elect renewable electricity at uh, a fixed rate. And I stopped talking because I see okay. it was too long. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I, I've asked that question and I need to answer it, I guess, about France. Uh, France has never been uh, interested actually in uh, putting a pipeline, the idea of the pipeline probably many of you know, since you in Spain has been there for a while. Um, it would be the easiest way to bring, actually one of the easier way to bring or, or the, the, actually the existing capacity that's in, uh, in Spain uh, to use it to a better degree and um, uh, flow it further into Germany in particular and that's why Germany and Spain both support uh, or supported at the very least the pipe building, building of the pipeline. But when you think about again, you have to look at the, the, the advantages or comparative advantage each, each country has. And uh, yes, there is the European solidarity and so on, but after, you know, the politicians in the country are still uh, being elected by their populations. So their interest is to make sure that your country is doing the best. And uh, in France, it's, uh, it's, natural, uh, it's a nuclear power that is the, their comparative advantage that's now being built up and potentially could be exported into the region. And that would compete with natural gas that would come from Spain. So why do you want to introduce additional competition to something that you're now going to be putting a lot of money into and hoping that it's gonna be, um, that's gonna be used uh, further out? Um, of course, this is a decarbon, you know, there's, there's no uh, CO2 emissions, so there is, uh, there's that. So you will also hear the arguments uh, that once you put a pipeline, it kind of bake it in for a long time to come and you end up uh, grandfathering a, 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 a fossil fuel and Europe potentially doesn't uh, need it. But that's, uh, these are the two arguments that I can um, you know, present. Thank you. Okay, yeah, this was a great question from the audience earlier as well, the question around the Global Gateway as a response to the Belt and Road Initiative and the role of the Belt and Road Initiative in the energy sector. Uh, and I, yeah, I'm glad we're revisiting it because the Belt and Road Initiative is something I've worked on a lot. Um, I think it's worth recognizing that China's initiative has evolved a lot since 2013 when it was launched. So 
for the first few years, I mean, up until relatively recently, sort of 2020, the Belt and Road Initiative played a really big part in Chinese financing of coal-fired power plants in many parts of the world, including in Eastern Europe. But starting from 2015, uh, Beijing introduced a new industrial strategy, uh, the um, Made in China 2025. And as part of that strategy, it wanted to advance into clean energy industries. And it's, the Belt and Road Initiative has been used from the very beginning to support uh, the growth of important strategic industries for China. I personally see it more as an instrument of China's industrial policy than an instrument of geopolitics, right? And so with that introduction of the importance of renewables from 2015, it got integrated into the Belt and Road Initiative from 2017 onwards. And China's financing of renewables has really picked up since then. And that is a really, really important part of the BRI now, although financing of the initiative has actually fallen a lot over the last few years. So Potentially, there is room for China to be playing quite an important part in the energy transition of other countries by rolling out it, you know, Chinese-made solar panels and wind turbines in other parts of the world. And that's great for Chinese industry. The interest from a developing country perspective, particularly a country that has, for example, critical minerals, is very clear that they do not want anymore just to, be, uh, just to have mining companies come mine the lithium, the cobalt, the nickel, and whatever it may be, uh, even platinum uh, for electrolyzers, for example. Uh, and then those resources be exported without any additional value add. So we're seeing increasing demand, for example, in Latin America, where there's a lot of lithium resources, for the, va the uh, further downstream industries, so refining and processing of the resources, uh, to be done in country. And so there's room for the Global Gateway, Build Back Better, uh, the US initiative, and the BRI to be doing a lot in support of the critical minerals industry in financing for downstream industries in those countries as well. And I think this is potentially one of the venues for competition between Europe and US and China, on the other hand, in the 5, 10, 15 years ahead. Um, but also competition over rolling out new renewables, uh, solar farms, uh, wind farms as well. And I think Europe has to watch out for uh, the Chinese wind industry undercutting uh, Europe and, and the US's wind industry because China's been subsidizing it a lot over the last few years. It's got spare capacity, overcapacity, and a reason to export a lot of its wind turbines now. So we may see that as a new venue for tensions between Europe and China. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. Uh, before we conclude the, the act, uh, I don't know if there's any question from the public. Uh, there. So a question again uh, from Matthias from Hale City. Uh, so we're talking about the war in Europe and of course uh, Ukraine comes to mind but there's another war in Europe in, uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan in the border of Karabash and Mr. Rivas uh, before you told that there were a lot of missions by, by the commission and by member states to secure um, gas supply. So. Um, uh, Azerbaijan might not be a strategic foe as Russia, but it's surely a very uncomfortable partner and potentially a reliable partner. Uh, so, do you think that the situation was as bad that we needed to give a hand to the Azerbaijani regime? <laughs> I'm an energy policy expert. <laughs> Not foreign policy at all. From the energy point of view, it makes sense, given the situation, that we needed to get more supplies. It is true, and this question is fair and has been put. It's not only a question that we need it. Can we really trust these regimes that will be supplying this energy on a regular way? Uh, we don't know, but the need was so big that... Uh, these decisions were taken. <laughs> no, I am. I don't 
Это но... Да. да. Uh, yeah, Adria from Universidad de Vic. Um, I, I actually have a, a question for each of the speakers, if that's if that's okay. Uh, I hope it's not too too long. Um, uh, first one, um, you well, the three of you have have been pretty optimistic. Um, I think some 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 academics are are starting to say that uh, perhaps we're heading to a kind of market, uh, electricity market in in which, uh, thanks to renewables having a, a a fixed cost, but no um, incremental or no uh, raw products um, cost, uh, we might be headed to a, a kind of flat rate model for uh, for uh, uh, for final consumers. Yeah, I, I wanted to say uh, or, or hear your, your take on that uh, from, from the commission. Huh? Uh, uh, second, uh, well, you, you, you said uh, the, and, and yeah, well, we know the, the pipeline the, the cross, uh, across the Pyrenees will never be built. Uh, however, there's, a, there's, a, there's been a, a compromise or, a, or an agreement to, to build a pipeline between Barcelona, uh, Barcelona and Marseille. Uh, I assume that you believe that it's never going to be used for, for gas and only for hydrogen, or do you think it's never going to be built either, or uh, what's, what's your take on that? And, and, and third, um, uh, Nicolas, you, you said that... Um, uh, the hydrogen is not really going to be that competitive, or at least as competitive as, as uh, in the U.S. Uh, for most of Europe, except uh, in Spain. I, uh, I would like if you could just mm, expand on that. Why, why, why is Spain so specially or, 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 or good or well suited for, for hydrogen? Thanks. Oh. Shall, I, shall I begin? Oh, why not? So. See if my microphone's turned on. Yeah, there we go. That's great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hydrogen. So the reason I, I do think the hydrogen pipeline from Spain may go ahead in the long run, although I do have a bigger question about it, which I'll come back to. But why is uh, Spain good? Look, in order to have um, cheap hydrogen, you need uh, reliable uh, sun power, solar power, and wind power consistently for as for as long days as possible, for as many days of the year as possible. Right? Because the main driver of the cost of green hydrogen is the cost of solar and wind power. So uh, parts of Spain have some of, certainly the best solar resources, but there are parts of Spain also with good wind resources. So uh, obviously the other factor is, is proximity to water, and Spain has a big coastline, uh, Water can be desalinated relatively cheaply compared to the overall cost of hydrogen. So within Europe, at the moment, uh, Spain, uh, uh, actually, and I should say Portugal too, to a slightly lesser extent, but Spain and Portugal have the best available resources for hydrogen. That is why potentially you might want to see a pipeline from Spain to elsewhere in Europe, uh, for the use of that hydrogen in industry. But my question is, and I don't have the answer to this, and it's a bigger question, is does it really make sense to move, or for which industries does it make sense to move hydrogen to the industry, and for which industries does it make sense to move the industry to the hydrogen? Now, if we're just uh, adapting existing furnaces in a steel plant, it may be cheaper to transport the hydrogen. But for some industries, it may actually make better sense to move at least new plants, to build any new plants that need to be constructed, close to the hydrogen instead. And I, I think the chemicals industry is the one, uh, certainly fertilizer, but also other chemicals, uh, the industry is most likely to be affected by this because chemicals that are produced from hydrogen can be transported relatively easily. Whereas steel, you want it relatively close to the place you're going to use it, same with cement. Uh, so in those cases, it may make more sense to move hydrogen to the industry. But this is a big question. I don't think anyone has the answer. Uh, it's certainly something I plan to study over the next months and years. Comes to uh, uh, the pipeline that that was kind of a con uh, agreement was signed. I think it's a matter of capacity, just nowhere close to what actually a pipeline 
uh, via land would have been or would have been needed, and that's where you, where, where kind of, kind of the, the biggest issue is whether or not it's gonna be, it's gonna be built. Um, and probably will depend. Uh, will it be used for hydrogen? It's not as easy. Uh, this pipeline gets much, much more expensive if you want to use them for hydrogen, or even if you want to mix hydrogen into natural gas. Hydrogen is very corrosive. Uh, it will corrode any natural gas pipeline, so you have to really make sure you're coating it correctly. In addition, actually, if you mix hydrogen uh, into gas, uh, it it has less energy. It actually brings less energy than natural gas, so you, your volumes of energy that you're bringing as soon as you mix hydrogen into natural gas are smaller. Um, it's um, actually the largest amount of hydrogen pipeline that exists in the world. Um, and moves quite freely is in the US, um, it's, uh, where it's produced um, by the industry as a byproduct, and on and actually on the basis of which and exchanges of which a market could be built, potentially supported by the IRA Act. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I, I just add one more point on hydrogen? Because I realise I maybe didn't answer the bigger question. So Spain is good in Europe. Why not the rest of Europe? I think the cost of it's too high. Um, it may make sense to produce a small amount for local use, uh, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, there's potential for an international trade in hydrogen in the longer term, and, and, and I think that's in a way more promising. So, uh, I'll be very short. Yes, having more renewables, my P more PPAs should reduce the volatility of the price for electricity. I don't know. I don't think it won't be a flat rate. Second, the prices that in the end you pay, the volatility of the prices you pay as a final consumer, this depends also of the structure of the market, the contractual structure of the market. For example, in Spain, for a long time, and now has been corrected, the prices of the regulated tariffs were connected to the wholesale price, what we call dynamic prices, so they were very volatile by nature. But also the structure matters a lot, the countries where the Normally, you, you, you have an offer of contracts which is two, three years instead of one, uh, fixed rates, etc., etc., and this matters for knowing the volatility of your prices, final prices as a consumer. Thank you very much for all of you. We have passed the hour. Uh, I know we have some more questions. Very, very short. Very short. One question. In the green energy future, what is the role of the nuclear? Mm. Uh, the, the official line of the Commission is, is a decision of the Member States. This is written in the treaty, in the Euroton Treaty. It's up to the Member States that they want to keep and use nuclear to do it. The only European policy, which is very strong, is if you use nuclear, you have to use it safely and you don't have to produce and you have to take certain measures in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to treat uh, the nuclear waste. In our scenarios, nuclear appears, and it's a part of the electricity mix in 2030. It's going to be a small part, but it's still there, significant. Now it's about 20%. In the future, it's expected to be a bit less. In 2050, we also have numbers, but I think are less reliable. If I can add, it will be very, it will be very important, actually, in Central Eastern Europe mm -hmm. uh, to get out of coal. The conditions there are nowhere near for effective use of, of uh, solar, particularly. So even though we see the increases of capacity, the actually capacity factor or how much can be produced is really low. So in Poland and Germany, it's approximately 10%. Um, so if you really want to effectively decarbonize those regions uh, and have them develop economically, because these are the least developed economically from the EU, um, uh, nuclear will come in as extremely important, and we actually have seen a lot of uh, now contracts signed. Uh, and if you look at what's happened in the last year in nuclear, um, Poland and yeah. the Czech Republic are two of the countries that have expedited their nuclear projects and the United Kingdom as well. Obviously, France will continue to invest in nuclear. And then it's in, it will be interesting to follow what happens in Italy uh, because it had uh, been opposed to more nuclear power, but uh, the current coalition government uh, has been more favourable on nuclear power. So pot potentially there's scope for more nuclear in, in, or for nuclear in, in Italy as well.